Hello, and welcome to part three of Arcadia University's BI 327 Histology Lecture on Connective Tissues. In part three, we're going to start to take a look at the cells associated with the connective tissue. And basically, the first type of cells we're going to be looking at are going to be the resonance cells, the cells that are going to be normally found and staying within a region of connective tissue. So if we take a look at a connective tissue, what we're going to see are a wide variety of cells. We've got lots of open spaces, so lots of opportunities for cells to come in and uh, essentially move through the region. The resonance cells, are also known as the fixed cells, are in general are going to be the cells involved with establishing, synthesizing, maintaining, and supporting the connective tissue. So these are going to be things like the fibroblasts, the reticular connective tissue cells, and the adipocytes. Later on in the next lecture, not in this lecture, but in the next lecture, uh, we'll talk about some wandering cells. Wandering cells are, are migratory cells. They're going to be able to respond to signals and move through that connective tissue. And these can be things like macrophages, uh, mast cells, uh, leukocells, essentially white blood cells, plasma cells, another type of white blood cell uh, involved with producing antibodies. But they basically can move through the connective tissue to respond to signals or respond to the need. Now, the first type of resonance cell we're going to look at are going to be the fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts are going to be the predominant cell type in a connective tissue proper. So your basic generic connective tissue is going to have lots and lots of fibroblasts in it. And it's going to be the fibroblasts that are going to be involved with establishing the connective tissue. So they're going to be involved with synthesizing all of the proteins, all the ground substance, all the materials that are going into the connective tissue. And they're going to synthesize it, but then as we see in, in all biological systems, things are going to start to break down. And so the fibroblasts are going to be continually, uh, continually moving through a connective tissue, staying still within it, so the resonance uh, of the connective tissue. But they're going to be synthesizing and maintaining the extracellular matrix, so they're going to be repairing it as they're going through it. Uh, you can see these cells normally as flattened connective, I'm sorry, flattened nuclei they're going to be pressed up against uh, collagen bundles or collagen fibers. Uh, but in general, if you can see a good region of connective tissue, if you see a nice flattened nucleus, uh, chances are what you're looking at is going to be the nucleus of a fibroblast. The next type of, again, resonance cell we're going to look at are going to be the reticular connective tissue cells. And the reticular connective tissue cells, reticular cells, are going to be involved with producing reticular fibers. So that fine three-dimensional meshwork, that jungle gym type system that we talked about between uh, hematopoietic, the blood-forming tissues, or lymphoid, the immune system organs, uh, they basically are going to be forming that three-dimensional matrix. Uh, occasionally, they could phagocytose some antigenic material or cellular debris, but in general, there are going to be other cells that are going to be involved with that. But the reticular connective tissue cells, the reticular cells, uh, are generally going to be very, very difficult to identify. Basically, in a hematoxin eosin stain cell, it, it's going to be almost impossible. Uh, you're going to use some specialized stains occasionally or electron microscopy. Uh, but if you were to look at them and be able to see them, you're going to see that they're stellate cells. So stellate, they're going to look kind of like little stars. Uh, they're going to have long, thin, cytoplasmic processes that are going to extend out and interact with the reticular fibers that they're producing. They're going to have a central, relatively pale, irregularly rounded nucleus, uh, but it's going to have a prominent nucleolus, again, because they're involved with synthesizing and secreting the proteins for establishing the reticular fiber network. The next type of resonant cells we're going to look at are going to be the white adipose tissue cells, essentially the white fat cells. These are going to be a type of unilocular fat, unilocular, uni for one, locular for lipid droplet. So essentially we're looking at a single, relatively large lipid droplet. Uh, these cells can be anywhere from 50 to 150 micrometers in diameter, so they're going to be much larger than most of the cells that you're going to be seeing within the body. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that because they've got so much of that fat stored in that single lipid droplet, they're going to be pushing up everything else within the cell up against the side. So they're going to have a flattened nucleus, they're going to have a thin rim of the cytoplasm, because that large open space is going to be where the fat is going to be located. Uh, because of that, because of the fat not taking a lot of staining appearance under normal circumstances, this is going to give a white adipose tissue or a white fat uh, region 
uh, appearance of chicken wire. So you see these kind of circular kind of twists of uh, cytoplasm and cell membrane kind of coming together, but lots of open spaces like a chicken wire with a little bit of imagination. Uh, it's often described as having a signet ring appearance because you've got this thin rim of cytoplasm and then you've got the nucleus kind of pushed up against it. And the nucleus is all like the, uh, the gemstone in a signet ring. Now, the purpose of white adipose tissue, of white fat, is that it's going to be storing fatty acids as triglyceride. So it's, in essence, storing lots of energy for the body in the form of these fatty acids. So lots of fat is going to be stored up, lots and lots of energy. Uh, so that's going to be an important component. It's also involved with shock absorption, uh, thermal insulation, and contouring. So you can find uh, fat pads, uh, like the palms of your hand and the soles of your feet. Uh, thermal insulation, um, mainly, mainly other organisms, uh, are going to accumulate fat. They're going to help them over winter. Uh, people also do, you know, tend to put on a little bit more fat uh, during the winter months as well. And then contouring. It's the fat that gives a lot of the body shaping uh, that can be occurring uh, within human beings. Now, in most cases, the white adipose tissue is going to be located within the hypodermis. Uh, the hypodermis is uh, a region deeper to the dermis or deeper to the skin. And it's surrounded and supported throughout by a loose supporting connective tissue. The next type of resident cell we're going to look at are going to be brown fat cells. Now, white fat, we said, was unilocular. White fat had a single large lipid droplet. In brown fat, we've got multilocular fat. So we've got multiple lipid droplets within this cell. And it's because of that, we're going to have kind of this uh, appearance that it looks like a gland because we've got the kind of large, uh, actually much smaller cell than a white fat cell, but we're going to have a relatively large cell with lots of little uh, kind of circular appearing structures within it. They're going to be pale staining. They're going to be these fat lobules. Uh, instead of white fat with the nucleus pushed up against the side and flattened, brown fat is going to have a spheric, kind of a rounder central nuclei. Uh, but brown fat is going to have a brown color because it's going to have lots of mitochondria and the enzymes associated with the mitochondria. So if we look at this, lots of fat, multiple dropules, multiple lobules, and lots of mitochondria. And so if we think about this, you've got lots of mitochondria to be burned and mitochondria which is very good at burning cellular energy process or uh, cellular resources uh, like fat or like sugars for production of energy. Now, if we take a look at this, uh, the mitochondria in brown fat are a little bit different than the mitochondria we've talked about before. And the reason for that is that they have a decoupling protein. Normally, mitochondria can go through that electron transport chain we're going to pass the electron down all the way through, and at certain points, we're going to be producing ATP. In brown fat, we're going to be decoupling that process, disrupting the electron transport chain. So essentially, that electron is going to drop down, but we're not going to be producing ATP. If you remember your laws of thermodynamic, that energy has to be doing something. If it's not producing ATP, it's going to be given off as heat. And so by decoupling this, we're essentially going to be burning lots of fat. We're going to be using these mitochondria. The mitochondria are going to be working feverishly on this. But we're not going to produce ATP. We're essentially going to be producing heat. And so we can see brown fat with a very rich vascular supply around it. So it's almost like a little radiator. So the blood flows through the region, picks up the heat, and carries it through the body. And so brown fat is found, uh, at least within humans, primarily in infants, uh, but it could also be found in like hibernating animals of other species. Uh, so it's going to be involved with heat production and maintenance of, of an individual's baby, uh, uh, an infant or baby's uh, heat. And that's it for uh, the resonant cells. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. And I uh, hope to see you at the next lecture. We'll start to talk about the wandering cells of the connective tissues.